Welcome to our video on trust columns. In a previous lecture, we were discussing the Firth of Forth Bridge, which has enormously large diameter, extremely tall uh, tubular compression members. And we mentioned the fact that those were difficult to make. They're about six feet in diameter. Even today, typically from extremely large tubing manufacturers, the highest you can get is 20 or 30 inches in diameter. Um, so this is kind of problematical, figuring out how to put plate together. In the case of the Firth of Forth Bridge, it was riveted together. And we discussed the fact that it was extremely thin walled and vulnerable to local buckling. So one of the things that we do to try and simplify this is rather than create one large element, we take smaller, more manageable elements and we weld them together. So for example, here we have a trust column. Uh, this point right here is stabilized because it's attached back to that. That one's attached back to that, attached back to that. And eventually we can trace the stability of all the joints in this truss back to some stable foundation. So in other words, each of these points is stabilized in some way against lateral movement. And as a consequence, these incredibly long slender members actually become very non-slender in their proportions because they're braced there and there. So the overall length uh, for buckling in that zone is fairly short and relatively speaking, the diameter is fairly good. So uh, we can do that uh, here. We see it at the scale of a fairly localized column that might be five or six feet on the side. Here we see an alternative view of that. Uh, we can also do this at the scale of a building. So here again, you see the notion that everything at this level is stabilized against moving that way by these tension elements and these compression elements. Um, and then everything at this level is stabilized relative to that level by this cross bracing. So here the entire building is trust and we can either think of it as a column as tall as the building or as one of these columns that's from stable point brace point to stable brace point um, we can do it with a pattern like this or we can think of really elegant ways to integrate that bracing pattern so for example here we have a stair uh, bay in this building and the diagonals have been very well coordinated so that the slope of the diagonal members is exactly sloping uh, has exactly the same slope as the stairs stairs of course are not on 45 degrees uh, they tend to correspond to a step upward of about eight inches and a horizontal movement of maybe uh, 11 inches or so and so you see that manifest in this uh, more gentle than 45 degree slope. But here we have a building that's basically can be thought of as a column and the bracing uh, of these members is what's allowing these sub pieces or these individual columns from failing. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes we'll use a truss like this because the loads are fairly light and the column is very long. So for example, in the case of this building, we have this pretty narrow expansive roof, half of which is supported on this side. So only half of this roof actually comes over and rests on these columns, but they're huge, tall columns, which are vulnerable to buckling. So this is a classic situation where we'd be doubly inclined to do a trust column, partly because the individual parts and pieces are inexpensive and can be welded together into this nice stable pattern, but also because this column really needs to be billowed up to give it breadth. The interesting thing you'll notice here is 
this column is actually supported on these two little stubs down here. And then this upper portion of the column only penetrates down this tube, only penetrates down far enough to engage this level and that level so that we're getting good moment connection between that tube and the rest of this trust cage. The irony in this particular application is that um, this trust column won't be expressed at all in the final building. This is what it looked like during construction. Then it got clad in thin stone sheet material in an attempt to make these columns look huge and monolithic. But in fact, the entire structure is all this delicate steel work inside and these panels are hung off of it. So they're actually not working in compression and not a significant part of the way this column is functioning. The other interesting thing, of course, is these stone panels weigh vastly more than the column that they are hanging off of. Now, we, we see these types of truss columns in a variety of situations. This is the George Washington Bridge in New York, which for my money is one of the most beautiful bridges in the world. It's pretty delicate. Uh, it's very strong and very stable due to this truss work. Uh, we can do some things that aren't so pretty also. Here we have trusses with curved elements that are brought to points. So we, ha we see the pin-pinned nature of these compression elements, but they've been billowed out near the center to give them additional breadth at the very place that they are most likely to buckle. Um, we see a similar geometry in this particular building, which has become quite famous as uh, the first seven-star hotel in the world. This is in Dubai. And you see that these compression struts are curved so that they are brought more or less to a point at each end. So these are pin joints. Then there are some elegant looking bracing in between. And then it's stabilized by cross bracing in between that. Um, pin jointed trust columns of this sort have a really attractive feature, which is you can use them for self-erecting buildings. So in this case, we have two long struts, which are able to pivot freely around this base and the base over there. And then this one actually has a, a bend in the middle of it and a hydraulic mechanism that allows it to straighten itself out. So it's a self-erecting structure. And you'll notice at the base, in order to get the full degrees of freedom that are required. There's a pin joint that way and a pin joint in this direction so that uh, you can get a full swiveling action for this thing to erect itself. <clears throat> so now we'd like to understand truss behavior uh, starting at the component level. Um, so we have a series of little experiments here we did. This is a 1 8 inch diameter by six inch long, and it was straight to start with, by six inch long plastic rod. Um, and it has been loaded by this mechanism, which has induced this buckling. And we did experiments where we loaded little weights on there, figured out how much it took to buckle this. Right now, there's just a finger pushing down to sort of illustrate the nature of the shape that the column takes on while it's in the process of buckling. So we said, we're going to build a bunch of truss columns out of this material. And the way we're going to uh, try and understand how the overall behavior of the full trust column is born out of the, the behavior of the components, we started off by testing components. This is a six inch column. We tested it for two, one, one half, and let's see, I think even three inches. Yes. So this is the data we got. This is the failure force in pounds. Uh, this is the length of that pin pin column. So in this case, the length is the actual length for buckling because that's the situation in, in our base case of the pin pin column. You'll notice it took about five pounds to fail this four inch column. It took a lot less than that for the six inch column. So 
it, we didn't even plot six inches on here as an option because it was too weak. Uh, we got up to about uh, nine pounds for the three inch one, um, 21 pounds for two. Then when we got to one inch, it was getting pretty strong. We had about 64 pounds and we went down to three quarters of an inch and finally half an inch. And at half an inch, we were getting almost 100 pounds of force. So there's a lot of difference between five pounds to buckle this four inch long column and 100 pounds to finally fail a half inch column. Then we made a series of columns and they were all governed by the following geometry. Um, they were 48 inches long. Uh, we had a variety of sizes, which we designated each one of these sides of the square base with the symbol E. And then we set the rule. We were going to triangulate the sides in this pattern and the spacing between the braced points would always be equal to whatever that dimension was. So if we got a bigger column, this dimension got bigger and that got bigger. We had two bracing patterns, one where four elements came and braced a point. So it's really obvious here the unbraced length is from right there to right there. So the behavior of this column is a little easier to interpret. When you get to this column, it's a little more subtle because the spacing between brace points is actually E over 2. Now, the reason that's tricky and confusing is that relative to movement in a certain direction, suppose we look at this member right here, and we look at it relative to buckling within this plane or movement within that plane. Within that plane, this point and that point are very well stabilized, but in between that point, you can have movement within the plane. In other words, this segment can start to buckle towards that point. Um, likewise, relative for this thing, this compression member, uh, we've got two elements that are coming back and bracing it in this direction. So it can start to move in between there, um, and this piece doesn't significantly stabilize it. So it turns out these two patterns are not significantly different in their behavior. Um, the unbraced length uh, for the local members is E, whether we're looking at this trust column or that trust column. Okay, so we did this study. Um, we made some slender columns, subjected them to forces, watched them buckle. So this is the initial stages of overall buckling, which is occurring for this fairly slender column. And once of course, once it starts to curve, you get a, an induced moment and the compressive forces on this side are very large. And in fact, at this point in the failure process, we probably have tension on this side, which is e exaggerating the problems on this back side. And eventually when failure occurs, we get a kind of crimp of this sort. But this was begun or this failure was initiated by overall buckling. On the other hand, when we go to a bigger column, we don't ever see overall buckling. The failure is initiated in this way. And this image kind of illustrates what I was pointing out, that if I think about this vertical and this vertical and the lacing in between them, um, this point and that point are prevented from moving towards that vertical but the portion in between isn't. So you see the classic sort of snaky sine curve where it's buckling outward here, it's buckling inward there, and these connections to that point are not oriented in the correct direction to help resist the direction of movement that's occurring. So the effective length here is this is lambda over two. It's half a wavelength and it's equal to E as we're defining E in the context of this particular set of studies. So when we got really large columns, uh, large in breadth, uh, 
because we said this dimension is equal actually this vertical dimension is equal to the horizontal uh, dimension of the sides of the square larger breadth meant longer unbraced length for these individual members so beyond a certain point the more breadth you gave the column the weaker it became because the more vulnerable it is to local buckling likewise when you go beyond a certain point if you make the overall column smaller and smaller you have more and more problems with overall buckling and it becomes weaker so we plotted the this data for the one inch column the one and a half the two and the three and we got these four data points and then we fitted them with curves and this curve for example we know the capacity of this column is going to go towards zero as the breadth becomes zero so we know even though we didn't measure this because you can't make a column of zero breadth um, we know that that's a theoretical point that has to fit on this curve so we fitted this curve we've got some that are getting longer and longer uh, and so we've now plotted this we know this is going to follow the buckling curve which is uh, in proportion to pi squared ea over the slenderness ratio squared so as the length goes up we expect this to follow a uh, hyperbola and it does and so the intersection of these two points is right there and then we worked out the theory about exactly what point the uh, slender column should induce failure at exactly the same load that the overall column experiences failure and the theory reinforced almost perfectly what we got experimentally which actually is probably a little boastful because uh, the experiment wasn't really as good as the numbers indicate but we got almost perfect correspondence between the experiment and the theory and it turns out that the optimal dimension is 1.6 so if I actually show the shape of that trust column, uh, it turns out that the, the proportions for the overall length divided by E, which is this horizontal dimension right here, the ideal proportions are L over E equals 26. Now, that's starting with a certain rigid notion of what this geometry ought to be we can change the geometry and improve that for example we can use this K brace kind of uh, system we can keep this dimension as E but we can make that dimension 2E because we've changed the geometry now and when we do that this is more the nature of the proportions that we would expect this is the optimal column given this geometry if we shrink it it becomes vulnerable to overall buckling if we expand this geometry without changing the slopes of any of the lines or anything then we actually um, make it more vulnerable to local buckling so these are kind of the optimum proportions now I mentioned earlier that uh, we use these truss columns often for lightly really lightly loaded situations but if we got a really long column that we don't want to make too um, out of huge pieces of steel plate we can still truss it this is the Citicorp bank building um, William LeMessure was the engineer on this um, Pedersen Cone Fox were the designers um, it's in in New York in Manhattan and the people who owned this church owned a chunk of this land that the bank wanted and the bank agreed to do two things build them a new church and buy their air rights and so the philosophy of the bank was we're going to get rid of the the corner columns that normally exist so normally there'd be a column out here and a column over there and they just said we don't need those columns we're going to move all of our structural columns to the centers of the walls so we'll have a core support and then four of these outlying columns and this produces a really interesting effect where this corner where traffic intersects 
gets opened up um, as a sort of public amenity. Um, these are a few more recent photographs of this building, which I took showing the church and looking up at the underside of the structure with these four columns. And that's another view. This is one showing the full height. So, this building, this is a diagram that LeMessure sketched on a napkin. This is right here. So he said, we can bring all those loads into columns at the center by using these compression struts, which reach out like a tree structure um, and, and carry that load down. So it looks something like this. And then he made the point that under wind load, um, he could get compression in this column and tension in that column and the shearing forces down near the base are going to get taken up in the in the core of the building. And then he drew a little more uh, precise uh, diagram of how the structure would work. So these outriggers are bringing loads into this column, which right now is rendered rather delicately, but it's actually a huge column. It gets down here and it flares out its loads to get wider. And the reason it has to do that is in here, it only has to be uh, stable from floor to floor. In other words, about every 15 feet. But here you have this monster tall column, which suddenly has to become, has to have a lot more breadth in order to make it work. And so it's been rendered as a trust column, even though it has huge loads on it, uh, it's still the economically logical thing to do to make it out of trusses so that you can make it out of smaller parts that are more widely and strategically spaced. So this is a photograph of that. Here you have that classic K truss. You'll notice this column now is properly rendered with the enormous forces that it's carrying. And then those forces split and get carried down on the sides of these columns. So that concludes our discussion of trust columns.